we brought together 10 authors from all around the world um, at points where we should have never started it, but finally got, got it's finally complete. Um, basically, the project was to set out and document every single species of Drosera, of Sanju, in the world, um, including all, obviously all of the Australian ones, but loads of them, particularly in Africa, um, and particularly in actually South America, were really, really, really obscure. Actually, I could probably do it better on my laptop rather than bring them up because you won't be able to see the pages. I've got a few. Yeah, I'll show you that. Yeah. Well, um, volume one, Oceana. And this looks specifically at all of the Australian species. As I'm sure you all know, there's more species in Australia than pretty much the rest of the world put together. The diversity here is unbelievable. To, to give you an example, there's only three species in the whole of the continent of Europe. In Australia, there's well over 100. And um, the diversity here is, is spectacular, from pygmies to tropical species to tuberous. Um, so one by one, each species is broken down. Every single species is documented in photographs, um, both of the plant itself and of the flower. And there's detailed information about its habitat, its distribution, its diversity, its ecology, uh, its growth cycle, how it grows in the wild, um, what adaptations it has to live in the wild, and so forth. And, um, well, you can look at the volumes later. The, the Australian species are very, very, very interesting because so many of them have been discovered just, or at least named, just in the last few, few decades. And particularly, of course, by the great um, Western Australian botanist, Alan Larry. So he was the primary author on this, uh, on this volume. The next one, the second one, looks at all of the rest of the Australian species. Here it is. So I'll just bring it up. Sorry. Yeah, okay. The next volume looks at all of the other Australian species, as well as those in Asia, Europe, and North America. Like I say, the, the European chapter is, is dismally thin with just three species. But North America has quite a few interesting ones, and as does Asia and the rest of the Australian ones. Um, this, incidentally, oops, is that species. Um, sorry, the photo just messed up. Well, that, that is it, there, of the of, Nepenthe, of uh, Drosera ultramafica. Um, yes, yeah, so each one is broken down again in exactly the same format, looking at it on a regional basis. And what we really try to do is bring together photos that exhibit the full diversity of these plants in the wild. Because it's all very well growing a single plant in culture, but particularly in the wild, when you visit different locations, they can of often look dramatically <coughs> different because of local factors, local populations, local genetic variation, and so forth. So for each different species, we try to encompass the incredible diversity of each species in the wild, whether it be colour forms such as this one, or, um, or just uh, yeah, the different genetic variations. <coughs> Many Drosera you have pure yellow forms with white flowers, others have red anthocyanin pigments. Um, so yeah, that's one of the things that, came, that seemed to come across. My involvement personally was primarily with the, um, the South American and African volume. Um, the Drosera of Africa and South America are really, really interesting because, like with so many Nepenthes, they've been relatively little known. Uh, to give you an example of how incredibly <coughs> localised they can be. Some species, such as Drosera solaris, can occur in an area the size of this room and nowhere else in the world. Many of them have not really been photographed ever, um, and certainly in any serious way. Uh, but the, particularly the African ones have some of the most interesting species. This is Drosera regia, which in the wild has leaves that can be up to 60 centimetres tall. They're big sword-like blades. And anyone that grows Saracenia here, you should definitely try this plant. It's a really amazing species, and its leaves can actually not just fold over, but they can, they can tie themselves in knots. It's one of the most mobile species in the entire genus. We try to encompass um, local variations of different species. Um, for example, Drosera cystiflora from South Africa it has probably the most beautiful flower of all Drosera species. The flowers almost look like poppies. Uh, they can be well, up to six centimetres across, and they can be a range of colours from pure white through to pinks, purples, even bright crimson with a black centre. So again, we try to document that incredible diversity of those different variants. And um, yeah, again, the habitats, we've got 
about 30 pages just documented to the habitats alone uh, of Drosera. And some real rarities um, mm -hmm. that, that haven't been documented before. That's Drosera alba. This, um, yes, indeed, yeah. This is a, a very rare sundew which hadn't been <coughs> photographed prior to this book. Um, Uniflora, an interesting one. This is a species that I was very lucky to, to name from South America, Drosera salaris. This is the one that occurs in, um, in the area literally of this room. That's the entire known population. There's nowhere else. During this project, um, this project had, had, been, had been the collaboration of people that had been in the field for decades and decades and decades. And some species, like this one, Drosera maristicalis, this one had been lost to science for, well, most of the 20th century. But a series of expeditions took place 15 years ago and finally managed to relocate it. And um, so we tried to show this plant, very, very little plant, in lots of detail. And some real, really newly discovered ones. This beautiful one called Drosera magnifica was found just last year, I believe, possibly the year before, from photos someone posted on Facebook. And um, it's one of the largest and most spectacular of all the South American species. So it just, again, goes to show how how much we don't know about these, these beautiful sundews of the world. So one by one, they're all documented. Obviously, these <coughs> photos just show the photos of the plants. Um, each plant has, has several pages of text to accompany the images, and um, shows each one hopefully in, in a bit of detail. In total, I think there are 1,500 1, pages or so long, so really long <coughs> books, and they've just literally been printed. The very first sets are in this room. Um, we got them FedEx from the printer, especially. Uh, the rest of them are arriving by ship in the UK in about a, a week or two's time. And will all be shipped out from there, but I got these sets FedEx specifically from the print printers so you guys can see them. So this is the very first sets in the world. And um, the thing that I really want to emphasize above all is that it's, it's a massive team effort with. 10 experts from all corners of the globe, including uh, Greg, who is here tonight. So, Any new species discovered while um, collaborating the book? There are a couple of new taxa in this, including a beautiful pure red form of, of Philiformis, actually, from North America. Um, but a lot of new information as well, a huge amount of new information. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when, um, just in December last year, uh, I went down to Tasmania to get photographs of Drosera murphidae because um, we didn't have great photos and there was also a couple of taxa in central Tasmania that were listed in Lowry's book as being a bit unknown. He didn't know what flowers were like, didn't know if they fitted into murphidae or Apturi. So I went specifically to target these plants to see if, if they were in fact new. and. Um, of course, found the plants and found uh, out that it was Murphidae and then found it on three other mountains. And so we've extended the range significantly. It was only known from one small part of the Hearts Mountains in southwestern Tasmania. So now we know that it has a significant range. Um, another one the year before, we were in uh, the Kimberley to get photos of many of the Drosera Indica complex. And uh, we found three new species that didn't make it into the book but just to show there's still a lot of a lot of plants still out there um, so we know of at least three more Australian species that will hopefully be described in the next few years um, but yes yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot of hard work it's uh, it's great to finally hold them in my hand because uh, seeing them on the computer screen day after day and um, I think you begin to dislike the, the work and uh, yeah, to finally get it held in the hand, it's, yes. a, yeah. it's a fantastic feeling. Yeah. Maybe take some tools top too. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> it's certainly heavy. I think they weigh about, I think it's nine kilos for the set. Um, they're, they're pretty heavy books. Yeah. They have about, I, I don't even know how many photos, but I think Four, four and a half thousand <coughs> images in them, so there's, there's quite a lot of both of them. Um, but, um, but yeah, there were a lot of work, but 
it was something that really, I think, I hope you all agree, it was a really worthwhile project. Uh, in the end, it was, um, it's not intended to be a monograph. So a monograph is a, a taxonomic work, um, but it's a first step to a monograph. Um, and yeah, I think the idea from all of our sides was just to, just to showcase these incredible plants in their incredible diversity, because many of them are pretty threatening in the world. Um, say, some species really do have, have entire ranges that you can quantify in a few square meters, maybe 100, 200, 300 square meters. So they're incredibly fragile, and many of them are, are, are very, very, very much at risk um, of, of destruction. So it's very important to get as much information out there as you possibly can, and showcase them so people care. Because the very first step in conservation is knowing about something and caring about them. So um, hopefully, by showcasing them, people will care about them and be interested in them. And if that helps in any way to their conservation, then that would definitely be a good thing. Yeah. By showcasing them, are you possibly exposing them to be <coughs> pillaged by people? Uh, absolutely, but. Um, <coughs> Speaking about the Australian species uh, in particular, there's a number in Western Australia that are now listed as critically endangered. And uh, they're, some of them widely cultivated, Pygmy Drosera, like Drosera oreopodium. Um, and uh, by doing this work and, and the research that went along with it, um, got it its listing as critically endangered by the IUCN, which then uh, in turn made it uh, listed as a threatened species in Western Australia and that's um, then given it the best protection it can get by the state government. Mm -hmm. So whilst, uh, and when we look at some of these species you'll, you'll see the, the ranges particularly for the critically endangered ones are quite vague for that very reason. We don't yeah. tell you precisely where the plants are <coughs> um, for that very reason but um, yeah they're it can work both ways, just uh, particularly for Nepenthes. Nepenthes are the, the yeah. highest threatened of, of all um, carnivorous plant genera. And you, when you find something, you know, we, we had uh, an instance where Stuart and I went to um, Sulawesi yes. and found a, a new Nepenthes species. And within two months of us going there, um, poachers had found out where we went, been in and completely decimated yeah. the plants. So, um, you don't have to publicise much to, to, for people who really want the stuff to find out where it is. <laughs> no, I think, you know, I think two white guys in the middle of Sulawesi sort of stand out and um, yeah. it, was, it was quite an unusual trip because you know, we've been into areas where white people haven't been for tens of years. Yeah. And, um, and uh, yeah, so for, for the people following behind us, they just walk into a village and say, well, there are two white guys here looking for plants, looking for flowers, and eventually they find the plants. With Drosera, though, the reality is they're generally not very, well, first of all, there isn't such a massive collector base as there is with Nepenthes, and second of all, they're generally, they don't command as high prices. So poaching isn't so much a threat of these, and also, A, that they have faster life cycles, B, that they reproduce more quickly, and C, that they're harder tra to transplant plants, um, and more fragile plants as a whole. So poaching isn't such a, a, a disastrous, sorry, let me, let me word that more, more accurately. Poaching isn't such a, gra a grave threat for Drosera as it is for Nepenthes. I would think probably more, correct me if I'm wrong, but habitat destruction through development, through climate change, through changing hydrology or food or action or whatever is, is probably a bigger threat to these guys more than poaching. I, I don't know any Drosera that's been exterminated in the wild through through poaching. Um, probably Drosera regia is probably the closest. Well, it's probably the closest. quite close. Yeah. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, habitat loss, changes in fire <laughs> regimes yeah. is uh, the two biggest threats. Mm -hmm. yeah. Certainly uh, in Australia, Western Australia in particular, ha habitat loss is yeah the number one threat. Yeah. Um, can I ask, there's a massive drought in South Africa at the moment in the Cape. Is that threatening species there? Or? Well, lots of species in South Africa, they're not tuberous like the ones in Australia, but lots of them have quite fleshy stems, and so they naturally die down during the dry months. 
um, and many of them, of course, are annuals as well, which don't don't live through the dry period. So I'm actually going to South Africa in a few weeks. I'll be able to tell you. Um, but I strongly suspect that it won't be as disastrous as it may seem because many of them either live on areas where there will be permanent watercourse um, or that there will be ones that actually die down or die out completely during the dry months. But I mean obviously prolonged drought would, would be damaging and detrimental to them. But there, like here, um, definitely is habitat loss that's just the biggest threat, particularly for all those different colour variants of Procerasis to Flora that I mentioned earlier. Some of those different colour variants with, with unique flower forms, again, occur in areas that are a few kilometres in size. Um, and I personally think losing those would be such a shame because those different populations, each one can be completely and utterly different. And they really are just not interesting just because they're carnivorous, but incredibly beautiful with those flowers. And so I'd, I'd really, um, we set up this project called Arc of Life and it, it's still really small and it, it, it needs to grow a lot now, but there, isn't, there already is a South African Congress plant arc collection specifically for that reason to conserve the diversity. Um, but so to address your question, yeah, the drought, of course, it is it's not a good thing, but it's probably less significant in South Africa than it would be in tropical areas where the species aren't adapted to drought. Um, but I've got to tell you, in September. <laughs> Any other questions at all? Uh, and the question is for both of you. Are you botanists originally or what? I'm an electrician. I'm an electrician. Yeah, no formal study in botany. I studied as an electrician and worked in telecom telecommunications for 15 years. And now I manage a botanic garden. So i um, always been passionately involved in plant conservation for at least the last 15 years. Um, yeah, so. So it's a hobby that again, profit. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, it was a, just a hobby. <laughs> Likewise, the same. I'm not at all a trained botanist at all. You don't actually have to really be a trained botanist. Um, uh, uh, crazy, yes. <clears throat> yeah, you have to be yeah. crazy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, it's yeah. You just really have to be passionate about the natural world. People often confuse, people often don't understand what it, what it means to, to name or, or find plants. Um, you don't have to submit it to any botanical authority for recognition. What you have to do is write a description that fit, falls within the guidelines, or rather rules, of botanical nomenclature. That's rules that are set out on the process of how you name a plant. Uh, anyone can name a plant. You could name um, a plant in your garden as a new species. It doesn't mean that you're right, but it's an objective process. So you can all name plants, and it's then up to um, those that read the descriptions to decide whether or not it's valid. So anyone can name a plant, providing the description fulfills, um, validly fulfills the criteria of, of the botanical rules of nomenclature. Um, yeah, and then it's out there for, um, for the botanical world to decide and, and objectively review and each person can have a different opinion. Um, and through that process, it, it kind of averages out and it kind of gets accepted in a general trend which ones are valid and which ones are not. Um, so you don't have to be a botanist to study plants. Um, anyone can. And I guess that's the nice thing about it. In fact, many of the greatest, uh, greatest naturalists, botanists and zoologists of all time weren't professional, professionally trained. Darwin himself, for heaven's sake, wasn't a zoologist or botanist in the conventional sense. He, he did the voyage of the Beagle with a with a copy of, of Lyle's books on geology and, and basically well, all the rest. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess that's the beauty of it. You can you can you can study nature without having to be trained in nature. And if you're passionate, you can absolutely make a difference and, and um, yeah have findings that are just as important. Or, or, or useful as, as professionally trained botanists and zoologists. So all of you out there can, can become part of this. Yeah. And what's the earliest um, Nepenthes, let's say, has been recorded in the form of fossil memoir? Has it left a fossil that uh, you can say in the geology column that you can say belongs to so age? Well, Greg will correct me if I'm wrong, but if I understand, if I remember correctly, there are absolutely no fossils of Nepenthes, none whatsoever. 
Their pitches are very fragile. Um, they don't fossilize, evidently they don't fossilize well. But there are certainly fossils of the pollen of Drosseraceae, which is what Nepenthes evolved from. Um, however, it seems, in my opinion, it's certain that Nepenthes existed prior to the breakup of the continents of Gondwana. There are Nepenthes on all the Gondwanic relics, like the Seychelles, like New Caledonia, like Madagascar, the north of India, and then across, um, across Southeast Asia. The speciation that we see today, the diversity of species that we see today, doesn't necessarily reflect where they evolved. So there's loads of species in Asia. That doesn't mean that they evolved originally in Asia. That just means that, that the ancestors, that when they reached Asia, they found a massive range of habitats and speciated really, really, really quickly and formed this incredible diversity that we see there today. I personally think that many of these carnivorous plants are much older than what people actually appreciate and realize today. It's almost impossible to really um, prove this, but Drosera in particular, the sticky sundews, um, first of all, have such an unbelievable diversity and almost global distribution. Well, it's truly global, ever except the, the high latitudes and distant oceanic islands and desert areas. Um, but not just that, their, their incredible range of forms and varieties um, and the genera that are thought to have evolved from them or from their ancestors, like Nepenthes. So I strongly suspect that there were things like Drosera, and who knows, possibly Nepenthes, um, that existed certainly tens and tens of millions of years ago, and maybe way further still but beyond. But in terms of fossils, to address your question, there are no fossils in Nepenthes. If I'm... Yes, I'm mistaken. Yeah. Um, yeah, because they're so fragile. But there was recently a, um, an amber resin, um, a leaf of Rorigula, or Rorigula, I don't know how to pronounce it, from South Africa, um, that was in a, in a, a fossil, fossilized bit of resin. And that was discovered in China, if I'm not mistaken, very, very recently. And I don't know much about this, uh, but it was pretty old. It was tens of millions of years old. And originally today, there's only two species that occur in South Africa. So again, it's another hint at probably a lot, who knows what, what's gone on in, in the concept of millions of years, let alone tens or hundreds of millions of years. Sure, we know how the continents have moved, but we have really very little understanding about how plants and animals have moved in between continents or become wiped out in some continents and flourished in other areas. And so this new fossil in, of Virigula in China um, it would imply that this genus was totally more widespread than it is today, um, occurring in, in what is now Asia. But of course, at that time, Asia and South, America, and South Africa would have been much closer. So these are such unbelievably complex processes. And in textbooks, you'll often read, X occurred there 100 million years ago, Y occurred there 300 million years ago. Personally, in my opinion, it, it's so mind-boggling bogglingly complicated. And what we see in the fossil record is a shadow of what it once was. We see probably one in a million, um, if not even that, one in a hundred million plants that existed in the fossil record. Probably infinitely more than that, in fact. So it's really hard to know what, when they occurred or what they occurred. But looking at where, where they occur today, I personally think Nepenthes predate the breakup, certainly of Gondwana. Um, which puts them, puts them back at an early point. Um, so it's really interesting to think of that and how they've changed in time. And interestingly, sorry, just one last point, that one of the most archaic is wrong, well, it's generally not advisable to use the word primitive, but the most archaic Nepenthes, or one of them at least, occurs on the Seychelles. And interestingly, this one is unlike all of the other Nepenthes. It doesn't have long, thin, filamentous seeds, like little filament-like seeds has small black hard seeds, almost like Drosera. For many years it was in its own genus, this is Nepenthes pavilia. Um, so this one almost has traits that kind of been left over from, from a, a Drosera-like ancestor. So the evolution is really interesting. And yeah, what we look at today is to also remember just the tips of all these different tree fingers, like Cephalotus, for example. Um, Cephalotus being the Australian, the Western Australian pitcher plant, and there's just one species of it, and it's all on its own on one weird 
limb of an evolutionary tree. And just to think back through time, I mean, okay, you could argue that it is just one plant that's evolved in, into cephalotis, but come on, I mean, that's so unbelievably unlikely. Just look at our own species, there's hundreds of species of hominids from the last 10 million years alone that, have, that, that branched out and some totally diverged, some became us, some didn't, some had different lineages. And cephalotis, I strongly suspect, is like that. There were probably dozens of different species that some died out, some went nowhere, some evolved, some hybridized, some came back, or whatever, and eventually linked to cephalotis. But along the way, dozens, if not hundreds, were probably lost. So it's amazing to think of all these different species. I think it was <coughs> I think it was a biologist that uh, came up with, with this quote, but I think it's 0.01% of all the species that have ever existed exist today. And like 99.99% that have ever existed have been lost. And so for Nepenthes, yeah, we see what, 150 today? Who knows how many there were in the past, let alone the preceding and sister genera that no longer exist. So it's very interesting to think about. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>